So uh, thank you so much for having me here to present uh, my work. Uh, uh, I am a postdoctoral uh, fellow at uh, the National Research Council of Canada. And uh, I've been working on uh, uh, trying to estimate uh, how frequently objects in the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt, or just the Kuiper Belt, if you uh, wish for short, how frequently these objects collide. And uh, although this is not uh, a cratering talk, I believe that uh, these things are kind of intertwined. So uh, I will uh, very quickly mention uh, what is the motivation for the work I'm doing, and uh, I will present some observational constraints uh, on the Edgeworth Kuiper belt, and we'll uh, explain the modeling that we do, and we'll show you the results. And finally, I will also uh, discuss uh, uh, possible fu future work. Uh, so collisions uh, in doesn't really matter whether it's in the Kuiper belt or it, in the asteroid belt. Collisions they uh, inevitably lead to uh, dust ejecta, to fragments, and uh, these are really important if we want to understand uh, formation of uh, tenuous rings around. Uh, uh, planets and uh, formation of satellites. Also, uh, uh, impacts could lead to uh, dust clouds uh, around uh, airless bodies, and they could also supply exogenic uh, neutral material to uh, to the planetary at atmospheres and uh, contribute dust to already existing planetary rings. And uh, the other thing is, uh, it could uh, maybe uh, provide some insight into the mixing ratio of the interplanetary dust because there is so many different uh, sort, sort, sources of dust uh, ranging from cometary uh, uh, as, a, as a product of sublimation and collisional dust and et cetera. So uh, it would be really nice if we could really un understand that. And uh, so since uh, uh, 2015, I believe we've entered kind of a revolutionizing era in uh, understanding uh, the uh, Kuiper belt or the outer solar system, I should say. and. Uh, we could use New Horizons crater ob ob observations to uh, expand and augment the size distribution of Kuiper Belt objects uh, using uh, crater counts and uh, their size distribution, and we can transfer these or relate them to impactor size. Uh, then we could also uh, uh, cal calculate the collision rates. This is different from the probability. And uh, this would kind of tell us uh, hopefully how much uh, dust is produced in these collisions over the age of the, how much dust has been produced uh, over the age of the solar system. And we can compare this to uh, the New Horizons student dust counter measurements. So, just uh, like a, uh, an introduction here, you can uh, see this is a, a face-on view of the uh, Kuiper belt. Uh, in, uh, in red, we have the orbit of Neptune. Uh, in uh, purple is Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. And uh, we kind of see the dense core of the Kuiper belt, also known as uh, the main Kuiper belt uh, or the classical Kuiper belt, <clears throat> excuse me. And 
this is a, a, an, an edge on view of the, of the Kuiper belt, uh, what it looks like. So in order to calculate uh, the collision prob prob probabilities in the Kuiper belt, you need to have a orbital model of uh, the Kuiper belt. And we use the so-called ensemble or ensemble of, uh, which is a compilation of three uh, Kuiper belt object surveys. <clears throat> The first one is the Canada-France Ecliptic Plane Service, which op operated from 2003 to 2007. We then have uh, uh, Mike Alexanderson Survey, and we also have the Outer Solar System Origin Survey, which uh, kind of uh, finished just two years ago, from 2013 to 2018. Uh, so it, for calculating the collision probabilities, we uh, split the, so, so this is the entire Kuiper belt in, uh, in the eccentricity and semi-major axis phase space and inclination and uh, semi-major axis phase space. So this is the darkest portion that I showed you earlier. This is the main, uh, the main classical belt. So we take this and we split it into two components. So essentially we take this dark portion here and split it to cold uh, population with inclinations uh, less than five degrees and hot populations with inclination greater than uh, five degrees. So these red uh, stripes that you see here, these are the resonant uh, objects. They're in mean motion resonance with Neptune. And we take these objects and we split them into three groups. These are inner resonances, these include four to three and three to two mean in motion resonances here. Uh, Pluto belongs to the, pop, the population of uh, three, three to two mean, uh, mean in motion resonance. Uh, the main belt resonances, which are five, uh, five to three and uh, seven to four. So essentially these guys here, uh, oh, sorry, these guys here. And auto resonances, these are which are uh, beyond the two to one mean, mean motion resonance. The two to one is this one here. And uh, we take two to one, seven to three, and uh, five to two mean, mean motion resonances. We also, uh, so the Kuiper belt is also split into detached component. Detached component is the blue part the blue object that you see with detached, it's meant that uh, these objects are uh, do not experience close encounters with Neptune. And we take these objects and this portion of black objects here, these, this is the outer belt. And we merge them into a single group to calculate the collision probability. So these are here the, uh, kind of uh, the parameters to distinguish between detached and outer belt. And finally, these green guys here, these are the scattering pop population of the classical belt, of, of the Kuiper belt. And these are, uh, these are objects, if you uh, took these guys and integrated their orbits for uh, 10 million years, each and every uh, one of these objects would experience a close encounter with Neptune, which subsequently would alter its uh, orbit with uh, a value greater than 1.5 astronomical units. So we take this classical, uh, we, we take these uh, uh, orbits uh, divided in, in this way and we use Wetherill's approach. Uh, there is a pay, pay, paper 
by Wetherill from 1967. It's really old paper, I would say, but the method of calculating the collision prob probabilities is just uh, brilliant. So you have uh, this small orbit, or this is your target orbit, and you have an impactor's orbit. You ask yourself the question, okay, what is the probability of these two objects or these two orbits colliding? Well, there is a way to cal cal calculate this, and uh, these are sort of the equations here. Uh, the exact form of these equations is not so much uh, important here, but uh, the intrinsic collision prob prob probability is only a function of the orbital elements of the two orbits and the collision speed be uh, between the two uh, between the, the two orbits. So for each of the pop populations that uh, I showed you, we create ten thousand objects and cal cal calculate the collision prob prob probabilities uh, be between them. And uh, because the population uh, will vary, the uh, number of objects in each uh, po population will vary, we later on uh, weight uh, these collision prob probabilities by the fractional abundance. Uh, so just kind of a side note here. So the actual collision prob prob probability is different from uh, intrinsic collision prob probability. If you recall from above here, from this equation, the final or the ac actual collision prob prob probability will involve uh, the size of the target and the impactor multiplied by the intrinsic collision prob prob probability. And to find the number of collisions or the collision rates, you have to in in integrate over this uh, uh, equation here. And so we've calculated the intrinsic collision prob probabilities and this is uh, what we find. So uh, what, what you see here, this is the collision probability, the color bar between cold and cold objects. And in the phase space of the impact speed or collision speed versus uh, heliocentric distance, we see that the most of the collisions, they happen near uh, 45 astronomical units with uh, collision speeds well below, I would say, uh, two kilometers per second. This is the highest collision prob prob probability that, that we see. And this is the collision prob probability uh, per year per kilometer squared. Uh, and this is, for example, uh, the scattering on scattering here, detach on detach, but this doesn't really tell us a lot about uh, how frequently these objects collide. And in order to give you a uh, more uh, kind of better un 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 understanding, I took the collision probabilities only for the main belt, and this is uh, what it looks like. And this is number of collisions onto 100 kilometer target body. So you take a 100 kilometer target body, you place it anywhere here on uh, on this figure. If you place it here, you won't uh, see any collisions. If you placed it here, you would see, for example, one one collision. But I should say here that an object wouldn't stay exactly at one heliocentric distance, but would move around here in a small area and would uh, accumulate. So you have to in, in integrate over uh, the heliocentric distance and impact speed to calculate the total num number of collisions. And this is on the right hand side, we see the entire Kuip Kuiper belt, whereas on the left hand side, we see the contribution of the main belt only. So also here, I would like to show you a figure to, 
kind of get an idea about the collision speeds here. So the collision speeds are uh, like the most of the collisions we believe occur in the uh, in the main classical belt with uh, the dominance of the cold on cold collisions where uh, the collision speeds are really very low, about 300 meters per second. Whereas for other objects, we see collision speeds up to uh, two kilometers per second, but their collision prob prob probabilities are low. And I would like to con conclude that uh, with our uh, calculations indicate that most of the collisions are constrained to the main classical belt and the collisions occur with speeds uh, below one kilometer per second. And next, having these collision prob probabilities, we will use uh, an underlying uh, size frequency distribution model for the Kuiper belt and compute the collision rates. And hopefully we will be able to cal cal calculate the dust production rate but this is difficult because we need to have a real understanding of what happens if you smack two objects of ice dust agglomerates, which are perhaps really uh, very low porosity. And we can compare the results with New Horizons dust measurements. Okay, thank you so much. That's all. Thank you, Abedin. Uh, great talk. Um, so it looks like we have at least one question in the chat, so I'll hand it over to Stuart. Yeah, so this one comes from Bill McKinnon. You have absolute, as in total, collision numbers. What are the smallest impactors that were considered? Uh, that's right, I should have men men mentioned that. Uh, sorry about that. So this is the number of collisions uh, uh, onto 100 kilometer target body with impactors uh, less than uh, uh, 10, 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers down to uh, 100 meters. Okay, anybody else have questions? Yes, he says thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, I have a maybe a extended work kind of question, which is, um, does this then allow you to approximate the size distribution of kind of smaller impactors that we haven't been able to see very well and using, you know, nominal observations of the outer solar system. So like collisional distribution models, something similar to what Bill Bakke has done for the inner solar system. Yeah, so this is uh, the figure that uh, I should have spent a little bit more time, perhaps. But uh, from uh, telescopic uh, ob ob observations of the Kuiper belt, we can pretty much see down down to uh, a radius of uh, 10 kilometers, which is the extreme, basically. Uh, but with crater, uh, counting and observations on uh, Pluto and Charon, for example, uh, we could uh, augment this and we see, we, well, we know now that there, the number of objects, uh, so this slope here is getting pretty shallow. So this slope is uh, uh, P -P people who do uh, probably creators would understand, but this, this slope is uh, 1.74, whereas this slope here is three. So we, we take this telescopic ob observations and augment them with crater ob ob observations to derive a size, a size distribution or extended uh, size distribution of the Kuiper belt. But in this work, we only, uh, we are mostly uh, 
focused on the intrinsic collision prob 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 probability, which doesn't really involve any size uh, com computation and so on. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah. Looks like there's another question in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, so Bill McKinnon asked the follow-up. Uh, can you speak qualitatively as to how the OSOS project updates the populations with respect to no idea if you can pronounce it, uh, CFEPS7, I'm assuming. So these are two different surveys uh, yeah. for those who don't know. That, so That is correct. Yeah, so uh, that's a good question, Bill. So honestly, <clears throat> uh, I don't know. Uh, so I, well, I know that the result did not change uh, significantly, although I've been working on this pay, pay, pay paper mostly for uh, almost uh, a year now because uh, the size distribution, uh, or not the size distribution, excuse me, the orbital distribution of the Kuiper belt uh, seemed to change uh, a little bit uh, with, with uh, a couple of months or so. But it's not, uh, dramatically different and now we also since you asked we also have a new size distribution of the objects mostly for the larger size here for the lar larger end this slope the first slope that we see here is uh, uh, 1.74 in uh, in Q but now it's more like Q so these are small Chain, chain changes, but I've been playing around with uh, ev uh, every time they provide me with new orbital model of uh, the Kuiper belt, if that helps. But other than that, the overall picture here that you see is pretty much the, the same. 